Okay, once again, 1 Peter, which is in the last part of the Bible, chapter 2. We're going slowly through the Word, so we're going to hit five verses. Contemplated on only doing three, but then thought I'd add a couple. But it's a little top-heavy, so we'll, we'll spend more time in the first three and then just kind of get through the last two. But let me start by quoting uh, Saron Kirk Gear, who said, The Bible is very easy to understand. But we Christians are a bunch of scheming swindlers. Okay? We pretend to be, to be unable to understand it because we know very well that the minute we understand, we are obligated to act accordingly. Isn't that the truth? We rationalize it sometimes. How many times have you said, Oh, that's not speaking to me. That was at that time, at that culture. That's who it's speaking to, not to me. Or... Honey, are you listening? It's speaking to you. you know. No, the Word of God is speaking to all of us and in every different culture. And we need to receive it and accept it. And so we're going to talk about the Word of God and how important it is to be in the Word of God and to receive it and to apply it to our lives. Last week we looked at verses 23 through 25 in chapter 1. And Peter makes many references to the Word of God. In 23 he said, The Word of God which lives and abides forever. Important. If it lives, it's alive, first of all. It's not a novel. It's not a mystery. It is a living word. And it abides forever. And in chapter 25, he said it again. The word of the Lord endures forever. Peter's the one that said heaven and earth will pass away. But his word will never pass. Jesus said that not one little tittle will be done away with. And a tittle is just a little mark. In the scriptures, an important mark because it just depends on where the hyphen is in the Hebrew or in the Greek on that writing. That little mark will not even disappear. So if heaven and earth disappears and the word doesn't disappear, how important is the word of God? Very important. And it has lasted from Genesis and is going to end in Revelation and go on forever and ever and ever. In chapter 2, Peter will build upon these statements concerning the word of God. Let's read verses 1 through 5 and then we will dissect the scriptures. He says in verse 1, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, As newborn babies, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Peter has written to encourage and to instruct. In chapter 2, we're going to find a lot of instruction by Peter. Chapter 1, Peter really expounded on this wonderful and precious faith we have in Jesus Christ. What salvation really entails, the blood of Christ, the work of God, and how precious that salvation is to us. It's a living hope, he says. And so it's imperishable and it's everlasting. And now he begins to give us instruction concerning our salvation. And as believers, how we should have fruit that is evidence of our faith in Jesus Christ. And so he gives us instructions almost immediately in chapter 2 to those Gentiles and also to those Hebrew Christians there in Asia Minor during really an intense time of persecution by the Roman Emperor Nero. And we're going to talk about a little bit of history back there in, in AD 63 and 64 and what Nero was doing to the Christians at that time. And as Christians, it sometimes is difficult not to respond to persecution. It's almost natural, isn't it? That when you're being attacked, that you respond to that attack. If someone belittles you, you you want to belittle them back. Someone harms you, you want to harm them back. Uh, The church was being persecuted and they wanted to get back at those that were persecuting them. Well, there's a way that we should act if we are born again believers And there's a way that we should act today, just like there was back then. So the nourishment of the word of God. Let's look at verse one as we continue through chapter two. He says, therefore, 
Now, therefore, always means to pause, to ponder the passage before it. So, therefore, so in light of what Peter has been teaching us concerning this beautiful salvation, he uses the word precious so many times in this little epistle. It's a precious salvation. It's a salvation that costs God's Son His life. He did it willingly for us. And we are to reflect Him and put on this new nature and allow God's Spirit to work in us and through us, this beautiful work that He has for us of love, and not one, as he will list, of malice or deceit or hypocrisy or evil speaking. So meditating upon that chapter 1, we now come to chapter 2. Therefore, under such great persecution that the believers were going through. Now this persecution were, was too much for the believers. So Peter was, in a sense, trying to encourage them. Encourage them not to have that malice, deceit, hypocrisy or Envy or speak evil of anyone, which was very difficult for them to do. Now, let me give you a little bit of history of what was going on. A.D. 63, Nero was the emperor at the time. His kingdom was, in a sense, old. Um, He wanted a new kingdom. And so what he decided to do was to burn Rome down. And so he began a fire. And the fire began to burn Rome down. And he wanted to replace it and build a bigger, greater Rome again to lift his name up and become well known for that. The problem was the rumor was going around that Nero started the fire. And so he had to shut that rumor down. Otherwise, he'd be in a lot of trouble. Not only lose his support from the Senate and also the people, but just his name that he would do such a thing. Well, at the time, the Christian church was growing. The Gentiles were receiving the gospel. The gospel was spreading. People were excited about the word of God. They were, they were sharing the word of God with people. The, their new faith in God, their new understanding of, of who God was in the Old Testament and coming in the New Testament and the life of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven. You know, it was just spreading like wildfire. And they were gathering together, they were having communion, they were fellowshipping, and they were just exploding. And so Nero saw the opportunity. And so he began to spread rumors. And like rumors, if you tell a lie long enough, guess what? People believe it. They really do. They really believe the lie. And so Nero said, these Christians, they're cannibals. They get together and they eat the body of Christ and they drink his blood. They get together and they have this communion with one another in their rooms and houses. And they're having orgies. And we need to stop this. It was them that started the fire. It was them that's causing all of this chaos in Rome. It's them and we need to stop them. And so it created a, it created a hatred towards the Christians. And so they began to persecute the Christians. They were dragging them into Rome. They were beheading them. They were killing men, women, even children. It was here that they would take them. They would dip them in tar and then they light them on fire. Nero would literally take them, put them, just, just, Put them on a post, just stake a post through them, put them in his garden and light them on fire to light up his garden. He would take Christian believers and he would throw them into the arenas so the animals would consume them. Or he would sew them in animal skins and then throw them into the arenas. That's what was going on during this time. That was the situation. How do you get through something like that without having malice, without having hypocrisy, deceit, envy, and evil speaking. It's very difficult to do. And yet Peter was encouraging this early church here, there in modern day Turkey, to be faithful to the word of God. That that is where your anchor is. That's your strength. It's falling back on what God has shared with us in his word. In fact, he may have even said, and I'm sticking this in there, look at Christ who suffered for our sins. So be like Christ. So his instruction was to lay aside. Lay aside. The word lay aside in the Greek is apple. Not apple, but apo. A-P-O. And it means away from or to put away. And so immediately he says you need to put away these things. All malice. Let me describe these to you real quickly here. Just so you understand. I think that you'll understand. The Bible is easy to understand. 
And it's very clear. It's up to us, though, to apply this. We need to put these things away in our own lives. We might be pers- being persecuted right now or suffering from something. I don't know what. The church is being persecuted right now, in a sense, in America. We're being persecuted because we don't agree with homosexuality. We disagree with it. There's a, there's a man who has a bakery. A couple comes in and says, I'd like you to cook me a wedding cake. And we're two homosexuals, and we still I like you know these names put on. And the man says, you know, I don't agree with that. There's a bakery down the street. Just go go over there, and, and get it. Well, they sued him, and the courts agreed with him. And so he either shuts down and doesn't do it, or he does it. That's the ruling. So he has no right to believe what he believes. He has no right to live what he believes. He has to live what they tell him to believe. That's not freedom. That's not the United States. And that's the type of persecution that's going on in the world today. Unfortunately, there are Christians that are being malice and do evil speaking. And we need to be careful that we don't do that. That's why I mentioned about the Mexico trip. All we're doing is trying to share the love of Jesus Christ with people. Yeah, they have sin. And we need to be clear about what sin is. But we need to love them in hopes that they will turn from their sins and turn to Jesus Christ. This word malice describes wickedness which comes from within the heart. It's a wickedness that starts in the heart. It's like starting a little fire, a little anger, and it grows into the point where you become angry with an individual or a situation. And it turns into malice. McGee said it means to have an unforgiving spirit. Now that is contrary to to Christian faith. We are not to be unforgiving. We are to forgive and to forget. How can we go to the past, hurts or pains or lies, and bring them back? We can't. We need to just forget it. It's in the past, and we need to look forward from this day forward and change our ways and move on with the kingdom of God. He says, My friend, you are carrying bitterness in your heart and a chip on your shoulder. Although you witness about being born again and about loving Jesus, nobody around you will be able to distinguish that if you are carrying malice, anger in your heart. You can't conceal anger or malice because it's just it's festering up in you. I, I remember years ago this, this one individual just struggled with the leadership. And he might have been right at the time. Who knows? But... It festered up in him. And I remember him coming into church and he'd just sit there listening to the pastor that he struggled with. And you could see it on his face, you know. And it's like, oh, it it hurt you to see that. You know, and it's almost to the point where you wanted to say, you know what, why don't you just go? You need to leave and and start over. Why are you coming in and, and approaching God's kingdom and giving to him and so forth with this frustration and malice in your heart? And it said, leave and go and start afresh. There's forgiveness. Let it go. And we need to do that if, if it comes to that. We're not to be vicious in nature or do harm to others. That's not what Christianity is about. The great crusades, I know people use it all. See, this is Christians. The great crusade, they kill people. Those were not Christians. Christians do not kill people like that. Okay, They don't do that. If that's your example of Christianity, it's a wrong example to have. You want an example? Look at Christ. That's your example. He died on the cross for you. He gave his life for you. He came to serve. In fact, he's still serving you, the Bible says. He sits in heaven next to the Father making intercession for you every single second of the day. And he is serving you, the Bible says. Every day he serves you with breath, with life, with your job, with the things that you have. It's all from him because he loves you that much. That's the example we need to look at, not the crusaders. That's anger, that's malice, that's hatred, that's trying to force someone's doctrine down someone else's throat. You can't do that. You can only share the truth in love and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. Now, all deceit, he says. And the word all is in front of every one of these words. So it's every form of malice, every form of deceit. The word deceit is doulos from the word dilo, which means to bait. It's like setting a fish hook, and you're baiting someone in to deceive them. And it's all various forms of deception. So have no deception in mind when you're struggling. Now, you can almost get the picture that these people are struggling 
with this persecution, families are dying. And so there might be some form of deception going on in trying to get around what's going on. You know, maybe they're going to pay someone off. Now, I'm not saying that we should not protect our family. I'm not saying that we should protect our children or grandchildren. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about evil deception. Or you have malice in your heart because all these go together. And you will do something to get back. You know, we need to be careful about that. Hypocrisies. In the Greek, actually, it's hypocrisies, in plural, in the sense. So any form of hypocrisy. Uh, the last two, the malice and deceit, are singular. The next two, envy and evil speaking, are plural. The hypocrisy comes because of malice and deceit. So in a sense, because you have this anger in your heart and you're deceptive, it creates hypocrisy. You're pretending to be one person, a believer, but yet you're living another life. That's hypocrisy. We always relate it to the picture of the old theatrical scene, how people would be actors and in that time they couldn't act. You know, so they would put masks on. They'd have a little popsicle stick with a mask, a picture of anger or a smile. And so they'd go out there and they kind of just, you know, act with this mask on. And then they take the mask off and they become someone else. That's what the word hypocrisy means. That with one person you're this way, with another person you're that way, and with another person you're, you're both ways. Who knows? That's hypocrisy. And we shouldn't have hypocrisy in our lives. Or envy. The word envy means not just wanting someone's stuff, but resenting the fact that someone has stuff. I was talking to a guy earlier and they went up to uh, Thoroughbred in Upland. How many go to Thoroughbred to see the lights? Probably all do over there in Upland. You know, they have this whole street. You know, it's just lights galore. You know, it's beautiful. And you can go up there and go, oh boy, these rich people. You know, and you can start resenting the fact that they have it all. Believe me, they have sin in their life. I, I know. I know, and I'm not speaking evil. Maybe I am speaking <laughs> I know someone who lives in one of those houses. And I know what they do in their business and, and, and how they're deceptive with their business. So just because they have it all doesn't mean that they're sinless or that they are not going through some sort of struggles or pains or deception, you know. Doesn't that mean that at all? Whether you're rich or poor, we're all sinners in the eyes of Christ. But we're not to have envy. Who knows what was going on? Maybe one family somehow <clears throat> missed the persecution. And another family, in a sense, is going, I wonder why they missed the persecution. What did they do? This isn't fair. Why can't we miss the persecution? God, where are you? If you're with us, you know, why didn't you save us like that? And that envy, that resentment will kick in, you know, in that persecution. Or evil speaking, slander, uh, evil report, reporting about others and their evil, uh, backbiting, Lies, defamation of character. We should not be talking about one another, belittling one another, dividing one another. That shouldn't be in the Christian church. Now, in the context at that time, it's understandable. Today, it's still truth. The scriptures are still true. As believers, we should not be evil speaking of one another. And if someone's coming to you and saying, oh, this and that, and you know they do this and that, you need to shut them up and say, that's not what we do as believers. The Bible says very clearly we're not to backbite. We're not to gossip. We're not to do this stuff. You know, we might think, well, but that's for that time and that culture. We're just having tea and we're just talking and we're just having fun, you know, and it just can't. No, God says no. It's wrong. Peter says it's wrong. Speaking about others in such a way as belittling or defaming is bad character in our lives. And we don't want bad character. You know what slander is? Slander is an attempt to make yourself look good by slinging mud at others. I'm not bad. Look at what they do. Oh, girlfriend, you are good. You know, you're telling me all this stuff. Yeah, shame on them. No, she's wrong for doing that. It's not appropriate to do something like that. And so Peter reminds them as believers, as born again, to learn through these persecutions, to trust in God and not to allow the fruit of sin to come forth from their lives. And so he says in verse 2, as newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word. That's where we get our strength. 
is that we have a, have a appetite for the word of God. The word desire there is in the strongest sense. It means longing for, longing for. Back when I was about 21, I had some uh, friends. One of them was Japanese. The other one was Korean. And they wanted to take me to try sushi. And so um, I said, okay, let's go try sushi. And so we went to a, a place in, in Los Angeles, a well-known place, and they gave me Red Snapper, which was, uh, shish, I think it's called shishimin or shimshim. It's without the rice. And I put that in my mouth, and I'm like, oh, my, where's the trash can? <laughs> I, wanted to, I just wanted to just barf it out. I did not like it. You know, so it was like, sushi, forget it. You know, forget it. Well, then, years later, a friend of mine, we were in Dana Point at a conference, and he said, let's go eat. And I go, okay, let's go eat. All of a sudden, he's driving. He goes, oh, there's a place. And I had no choice, and it was a sushi bar. So I'm like, okay, I'm just, I'm not going to say anything, you know. So we got in there, and he, he actually ordered sushi, which is, which is fish with rice, totally different. And so I had it, and I'm like, wow, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. When we were done, I couldn't wait for the next week to go again and have it again. And then all of a sudden I noticed it was like every week, if not every month, I wanted sushi. I had this desire for sushi. It was a craving. It was a craving. I could not get around thinking about sushi. You know, fill it up and then all of a sudden you're hungry again. It's it's like Chinese food. That's the word that he's speaking of here, having a desire for the pure milk of the word. What's the first thing that a baby who comes out of the womb wants? Milk. It's the first thing is milk. I mean, it, it, a side note, it shows you how selfish babies are, right? Because the first thing they think about is what? Themselves and their bellies. Feed me! And I'm not going to shop until you feed me! <laughs> you know? <laughs> Hang on. No, I'm going to let you know I'm not hanging on. I want to eat now. And as soon as you give them milk, what happens? Like, wow. And all of a sudden they glow and they're beautiful. They're like the most precious thing in the world. It's, it's beautiful. But they want milk. But not just milk. They say the best milk is the mother's milk, right? It's the best milk. And if you can't give them the mother's milk, what do you give them? Then give them this formula because it has everything that the baby needs in order to grow their body. And so as Christians, we are bred by the word of God, aren't we? Peter mentioned in chapter 1 that it is the word of God that draws us to Christ. It's the word of God that brought us to Christ, that revealed Christ to us, and then showed us how to come to Christ and give our lives to Christ and now live for Christ. And so as believers, we need to feed off of the word of God. We need to crave it, in a sense. So Peter's point is, like babies, longing for nothing but the milk, and will take nothing else but the milk. So every Christian should take no spiritual nourishment but from the Word of God. That's important. That's important. Let me spend some time here. I want you to grasp this. Job said this in 23.12, I have not departed from the command of his lips. He's talking about God. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessity for food. How important is the word of God to Job? Very important. More important than food. I'd rather eat the scriptures than eat food to sustain my life. Peter's saying like newborn babies, the first thing you need is the pure milk in order to sustain your life. The pure milk. Every believer should thirst for the pure word of God. The Bible is literally God speaking to you and nourishing you and loving you. In a sense, it's a lullaby to you because he loves you. Interesting, the word pure. The word pure means undiluted. You want that milk from the mother. Why? Because it's the best milk. Now, you don't bring the baby home and say, Honey, are you done barbecuing the chicken, the carne asada, the beans and the rice? Because a baby's hungry. Well, um, excuse me, uh, we don't feed the baby carne asada with chile on it. You know, it's too much for the baby right now. You've got to just give the milk, undiluted milk, nothing else. can't do that. Otherwise, it will harm the baby. It will affect the baby. You know, the baby will come out like me. You know? No, I'm just kidding. 
So Peter's point is, is the word of God is sufficient. It is enough. It was enough then, it is, it is enough today. A lot of us love the word of God. We read the word of God. We go to church where the word of God is preached. But we dilute the word of God. We mix the word of God with other things. And that shouldn't be the case. We need to be careful that we don't mix the word of God with other things. Uh, Tony Evans, who is a great teacher, he uses the analogy of a candy apple. This is what he says. At most county or state fairs, you can find candy apples. Apples dipped in sugar. That's all it is, is sugar. He says, now, apples by themselves are great. They're healthy fruits. You know, they're, they're wonderful for you, for the digestive system. You know, some of them taste good, and there's all kinds of apples, and they're all good for you. But once you dip them in sugar, however, you've just killed the benefit of the apple, although it tastes real good. The candy apple is sweet, but its nutritional value is diluted because something with no value has been added to it. Many of us read the word, hear the word, and talk to people about the word, but then we dip it in a human perspective. Now, even what I'm saying to you right now is, is, is what we call expounding on the word. But just reading the word itself is even, even greater than my words. Because it's God's living word. We need to understand that. There are too many preachers that are preaching the word of God and they are just telling you what they believe. What they think. Oh, they fill the Texas stadiums with hundreds of thousands of people, but they'll never tell you you're a sinner. They'll never tell you that homosexuality is wrong, according to the Bible. See, I personally love that because it's not my opinion. If it was my opinion, you know what I'd tell you? And this is what I said before, before I was a Christian. If they want to be homosexuals, then let them do their own thing. You know, they don't, I don't care. What does that bother me? But I tell you because the Bible says it in Romans chapter 1 and Leviticus and all over that it's sin. And they need to repent and turn to God and have a right relationship. Their Bibles right now that they are taking and rewriting them so it includes homosexuality. Sad. There's a Christmas play. Right now, I believe in Orange County, that's controversial. And it's a play about Adam and Steve. This is the stuff that gets watered down. Well, let's take the scriptures. I'm sure there's a Steve somewhere. You know, and they water down the word of God instead of just teaching what the word of God says. Now, I don't have anything against homosexuality. I love the people. God loves them. It's the sin. Just like with alcohol. I was watching HGTV the other day, it's just like with smoking. And so the, what do they call these? Yard crashers. You ever see yard crashers? I love that show. And they'll, cra- they'll come to you at Home Depot and they'll tell you, hey, I'll take me home and I'll redo your yard. And they're like, yeah, right. Who are you? Well, I got a camera here watching us. Who do you think I am? And so they take him home. And so this young couple yesterday, they were interviewing me. He says, so what do you do? He goes, I'm actually a, a pastor, associate pastor, and I run the youth. And so, oh, well, that's wonderful. He goes, well, what do you see back here? Well, I see a spot where I can actually sit down and smoke my pipe. I'm like, oh. And I'm like, oh. I can see a bunch of teenagers saying, he smokes pipes. Oh, why can't I? You know, and I'm like, why can't we be careful? You smoke your pipe, just keep your mouth shut and smoke it in the bathroom. You know, it's like, why you got to tell everybody? I mean, it, it, it's not preached against in the Bible, but it's not. And he could for us, you know. It doesn't take care of God's temple. It destroys it, if anything. People die of cancer, and then you become a burden on everyone else's insurance policies because you're paying for their cancer when they have to go through surgery and so forth. I mean, there's a lot more to it than we, we really think. You know, I thought, what a, what a great example that was. I'm sorry. You know, we need to share truth. We can't water it down. And that's what Peter is saying, the pure milk of the word. We can't water it down with any humanistic view, any other religious view whatsoever. I was speaking with uh, my PT. She's a Christian, Oklahoma. Who isn't when you live in Oklahoma, right? (laughs) Bible belt of our nation. And so we're talking and so forth. And then all of a sudden she she says, well, you know, karma. I'm like, oh, 
karma. What if there's no such thing as karma? You know what karma is, right? If you cause harm to someone, then karma is going to get you and harm is going to come to you. Is that true? No. There is a truth in Scripture, Galatians, that says if you sow sin, then you'll reap sin. That's truth. I remember we were at the beach one day and we're trying to find a parking spot. I don't believe in karma, but this is funny. And so my mom jumps out because there's a parking spot. And so she's like blocking everyone from getting in there. We were right there next and I came around. And all of a sudden I jump into the spot and this other car comes in and she gets mad. She's screaming and screaming. And she goes, karma's going to come on you guys. And I'm like, well, what did you do to cause this karma on you? (laughs) That's not true. We water it down. You know, because that's not true. It's not true, but the Word of God is true. And we need to stick with the pure Word of God. You can't go wrong and you will grow. And in fact, the next statement, he says that you may grow thereby. And a baby who eats the mother's milk grows healthy, right? Very healthy and strong. And everything falls into place. But you feed it in the house and it gets sick and may even die. There's a Scottish preacher who said sin will keep you from your Bible or the Bible will keep you from sin. Isn't that true? Either you're sinning and you don't have time for the Bible because you're dealing with this sin. You love this sin. And if you read, you get convicted of your sin. And so I don't want to read that because it's too hurtful. Or you read your Bible and you let it sift through you. And you go, wow, this is something to stay away from. I don't want to do this. This hurts the Lord. This is how I ought to live. If I I want to sow bountifully and reap bountifully, then then I want to do this. And then the Word just reveals to you your heart. It shows you your direction. And you grow thereby. Someone said that one week without reading your Bible makes one week. W-E-A-K. You become weak. In this world, and so then you fall into various lessons, sins, and so forth. Crave the word, crave it, not just hear it, crave it, love it, and grow thereby of it. People are talking a lot about church growth. How do you cause a church to grow? Uh, what method? What what technique? And this is all church membership. Peter isn't talking about that. Peter is addressing growth in grace. Growth in knowledge of their Savior Jesus Christ. Having a personal relationship with Him. Are you growing spiritually or are you just growing old? There's a big difference. You can just be growing old. I'm just buying my time till God comes and I get to go to heaven. And I'm just waiting. Well, what are you doing? Well, nothing. I'm waiting for Him. That's grace, right? It's free. So let it come. Or are you growing spiritually? Are you challenged? Are you using your gifts? God has called every one of us with a gift and has gifted it to you to use for His glory. You might not think you have purpose, but you do have purpose. God created you specifically. You are all individuals, unique in every way. And God loves you and wants to use you in a mightily way. More than you can even imagine. And if you take steps of faith, you will be blown away by what God will do. I'm blown away that I'm even standing here before you speaking. Because that's not me. And I know my speaking is not very good. Before I was a Christian, I was always the kid, the young adult that sat in the back. Didn't want anyone to see me. And I never spoke because if I spoke, I sound stupid. So I didn't say anything. And then I come to Christ and start reading His Word and just devouring it, getting into it. My vocabulary increasing. My boldness getting stronger. And next thing I know is I start speaking up. I start saying things. And people will start looking at me like, who are you? Where did you come from? Like, what are you talking about? Well, you used to be a little four-eyed kid. Part your hair on the side, because that's a style now today. You know, and nobody ever heard from you. Well, that's because I was dumb. I was stupid. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to say anything. Well, now you have this vocabulary and you're speaking up and saying things like, wow. Like, that's Christ in me now. Christ has amazing things. I would never stand up here and share. Never. Remember in school how they would ask you, okay, kids, we're, we're, 
going to have you do a report and then you're going to share with all the kids. There's no way I would do that. In fact, I got an F because I didn't do it. You know, I'm not going to share in front of my friends and so forth. But God has a purpose and a plan. And when he takes hold of you and you're willing to freely give your life to him, he will use you in a great way. Because you're growing. So either you're going to grow spiritually or you're just going to grow old. Yeah, you can sit around and do nothing and you'll get to heaven, but you'll... You won't have much when you get there. He goes on and says in verse 3, If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. The word taste talks about personal experience. If you have tasted of the Lord, I've tasted of the Lord and He is good. He is good. I love Him so much. He has done so many miracles in my life. It's just amazing. I remember one time I asked Him, Lord, just show me your love. And He poured His love on me. To the point where I was just weeping and crying because I sensed his presence so greatly. I finally said, Lord, stop showing me your love. It hurts too much. You ever love someone enough that it hurts? You know, usually teenagers understand that feeling. So I do because I fell in love at 13. And it hurt so bad not to be with this person that I ended up marrying them at 18. That's how much I love them. And if I... I couldn't live without them, and so I had to love them. Now, I'm not saying that's the right way to go. In fact, I say it's the wrong way to go, and that I took a chance, but God's grace blessed me, and we've been married 35 years now. But you love something so much because you've tasted it. And when you taste of the Lord, there's a craving there for the Lord, especially His grace. The psalmist said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He is good. There's a beautiful story of a blind girl. It says, after she had learned to read by touch, her friends gave her a Braille Bible, the Gospel of Mark. She read it so much that her fingers became callous and insensitive. She loved it so much. In an effort to regain her feelings, she cut the skin from the ends of her fingers. Tragically, however, her calluses were replaced with permanent and even more insensitive scars. So she sobbingly gave the book a good kiss goodbye. Farewell, farewell, sweet word of my heavenly father. In doing so, she discovered that her lips were even more sensitive than her fingers had been. And she spent the rest of her life reading her great treasure with her lips. When she kissed the Bible goodbye, her lips touched the bumps on the page. And she realized, wow, I could literally read with my lips. Now that is getting intimate and tasting the Word of God. It's a beautiful picture of God's grace if you've tasted it. If you haven't, the evidence is there. There won't be no fruit that you've tasted the Lord. But if you've tasted the Lord that He is good and that He saved you for a purpose and that He saved you from your sins and you realize that, you're going to be so excited. You're going to want to read His Word. You're going to want to serve Him. You're going to want to do whatever it is He asks of you to do because the grace is so amazing. So He says, coming to Him as a living stone. The word coming means literally to come forward or facing towards Him. So now coming to him, as Peter says, knowing him, being born again, this living stone. The living stone is taken from Isaiah 28. Behold, I lay in Zion for a, for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, the sure foundation. And that's Jesus Christ, the rock. He is our rock, a picture of the rock. Moses in the wilderness, strike the rock and the rock gave living water. Jesus is our rock. He's our stronghold. When we need help in time of need, go to the rock. He's a living stone. And we coming to him, he said, rejected by man and chosen by God and precious. Jesus is more precious. And that's the gospel, right? He was rejected by men, chosen by God to die for the sins of the world, that we would have eternal life. Then he says in verse 5, you also, speaking to all believers as living stones, we too are living stones as Christ, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood jesus is a living stone we are living stones we are the temple of god paul tells us in corinthians god lives and dwells within us and we are priests and as priests we can as it says here offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god through christ jesus 
there was a Spartan king. You know who the Spartans were, right? They were a mighty nation in a sense or tribe or group of people that were great warriors. And there was a visiting king who came by as this Spartan king was boasting about his great walls. And he said, I look around and I don't see any great walls. And the king pointed to the Spartan soldiers and said, there are my walls. Every man is a wall that you have to get through. He says, and together we are a great wall of God. See, we are all housing Christ in us. We are his temple. And together... We make the kingdom of God, which is a great city, a great wall against all that stands against us. And that is where we offer up our offerings, our spiritual offerings, our sacrifices, and they are acceptable to God because Christ dwells within us. Not because of us, but because of Jesus Christ who dwells in us. So let me finish this morning. As newborn... We should have humble, honest hearts, willing to do what God's word says, not diluting it with worldly wisdom, with humanistic ideas. A well-read Bible is a sign of a well-fed soul. We should hunger and thirst for the word of God. This is how you grow. John fifteen seven. Go to God in prayer daily. Every day, when you get up in the morning, just go to God in prayer. Lord, I I just want to come before you this morning, and I want to lift this day up to you. I want to ask that you would just take control, that you would lead me and guide me, that you would help me not to have malice, that you would help me, Lord, not to speak evil, not to slander, not to envy, not to be deceitful, Lord. Help me today, Lord. And once you do that, read the Word. Acts chapter 17, 11. Read the Word of God daily. Just pick it up in the morning before you go out and read a few scriptures. Take a book and just start in the beginning and read a few scriptures. Or at lunchtime, have your little book with you. There's a little pocket book. There are all kinds. You can do it on your phone. I mean, there's, there's no excuse. But get into the Word of God and read it. You can do the daily devotions with us on Facebook. Any time of the day. Or do it yourself. And then obey God's commandments. When you do the devotion and you ask yourself, is there a promise there? Then obey them. Say, yeah, Lord, there's a promise. I claim that promise. Give me that promise, Lord. I want that promise too. Or if there's an error to avoid, Lord, help me not to walk down that path. Make that same mistake, Lord. Claim that. And you see that in John 14, 21. And then witness for Christ. Share what God has done for you. John 15, 8. Matthew 4.19. Just share with others. Jesus is in my life. He's changed my life. They'll see it. Because the the natural thing is for you to change when you come to know Christ. Because you're a born again believer. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. And then just trust God in every detail of your life. We see that in 1 Peter 5.7. Casting all our cares upon Him because He cares for us. Just trust Him. Know that He's working. Even in the bad times. Even under persecution and suffering. God is doing a work. A seed is in Iran in prison right now. But God's doing a work through Him right now. We want to free Him. And I understand that. But maybe God doesn't want to free Him yet. Because He's ministering to whoever's there. That will take that gospel message and go out to Iran. You never know. Philip went to the Ethiopian eunuch by some water and shared with him. And that Ethiopian eunuch went back to Africa and shared the gospel. And that's why there are a lot of believers in Africa today. You never know what God is doing. Last, allow him to control and empower your daily life. Galatians 5, 16 and 17, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, through the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit. Ask Him to do those things. And you can find those things on our little track, right on the back. So if you wrote them down, I'm sorry. I didn't tell you right away. But pick up a track and you can share it. Simple. It's easy to understand. And you can even just give it to someone. It's that simple. Learn it. Study it so that you can give it out. And then you have the growth on the back. And it's actually growth. G-R-O-W-T-H. Go to God. Read. Obey. Witness. Trust. The Holy Spirit. And you will grow in the Lord. I want to pray for you. If you have not been reading the Bible, I want to pray for you that you would, you would uh, gain a hunger for it and that God would give you this desire and you would begin to crave it 
every day. Can I pray for that? If you're okay with me praying that, raise your hand. No? Okay, good. Then let me pray for you. Let's bow our heads. Father, I, I lift up your church here this morning, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that in the depths of their hearts, if they've tasted of you, Lord, that you would give them a desire and a craving for that taste on a daily basis, Lord. Lord, that they would hunger for your word. And like Job, Lord, they would rather (coughs) taste your word before they taste any food, Lord. And so, Father, through the Holy Spirit and through your grace and your mercies, Lord, fill them, Lord. And give them that hunger. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.